Welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we're going to discuss acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, as well as mechanical ventilation. So let's dive in. So first of all, what is the pathophysiology that is underlying ARDS? Well, this is the result of proteinaceous fluid and cytokine leakage into the alveoli, causing alveolar collapse as a result of a loss of surfactant. Now, the diffuse damage that's caused by this process leads to hypoxemia due to impaired gas exchange, as well as pulmonary hypertension because of the hypoxic vasoconstriction. So the lungs become much less compliant because of the loss of surfactant, as well as lung edema. Now, there are some very specific criteria for ARDS that need to be met in order to receive the diagnosis, and these are laid out in the Berlin definition of ARDS. First, there needs to be some kind of insult that has occurred in the past one week. And we'll get to these risk factors in a moment, but by far, the most common is sepsis. Next, the patient must have bilateral opacities on their chest x-ray or CT, and this cannot be explained by another problem like pleural effusion or lung collapse. Next, the respiratory failure must not be due to heart failure or fluid overload, and you're going to confirm this with either a BNP or an echo. And finally, there must be hypoxia. And depending on the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio, the patient will be categorized as having mild moderate, or severe ARDS. Now, to have ARDS, the patient must have a PaO2 to FiO2 ratio of less than 300, and they must have some kind of positive airway pressure, whether it's ventil ventilation or CPAP. Now, we will go into mechanical ventilation a little later in this lecture. Um, with a PaO2 to FiO2 of 201 to 300, we categorize this condition as mild. From 101 to 200, it's moderate, and under 100, it is severe. Now, here we can see those clinical insults that can result in ARDS. Remember, sepsis is the number one cause, but as you can see here, there are a lot of potential infectious and non-infectious causes, like pneumonia, trauma, especially if there's multiple fractures in their history, as well as transfusion-related acute lung injury. Now, even pancreatitis can cause ARDS because circulating pancreatic enzymes can damage the endothelial membrane. Increasing cytokines and leakage into the lungs, that can cause diffuse bilateral alveolar damage. Now, don't forget all of the volume-related terms that we discussed in a previous lecture. Um, they're going to come in handy here. So if you need a refresher, go ahead and review that lecture on spirometry. Here's a couple quick um, definitions that you need to know uh, in case you need a quick refresher. Here they are. Uh, we have the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and the partial pressure of oxygen. So if you need to check those out, by this point, hopefully you know those. Um, now let's talk ventilators. Now, ventilators have a lot of moving parts to them, so we are just going to cover the very basics here that will help you get through and help you help educate you on what you need to know for the exam. So first, remember, ventilators are going to provide positive pressure delivery of air to the lungs. And this can be thought of broadly as being done in one of two ways. Either you're controlling the volume of air that's being administered, or you're controlling the pressure that's being pushed against the lungs to administer the air. Now, there is no statistically significant difference in mortality between volume and pressure-assisted control ventilation, and both are used depending on circumstances and physician preference. Each has its benefits and drawbacks, and as you can imagine, you don't want to damage lungs that are very non-compliant by blasting them with a set volume but then the pressure needed to reach that volume is incredibly high, causing trauma. You also do not want to be delivering really low volumes by setting an ideal pressure and not ventilating appropriately. So you can see it's, it, it, it's sort of a, a balance. Now, these determinations are completely outside of the scope of the CK, luckily. But understand that for volume-limited assisted control ventilation, you're going to set the ventilator to administer a predetermined tidal volume at a set rate, so that minute ventilation is the same with each breath. Now, the airway pressure that this causes is a result of individual patient factors like airway resistance, lung compliance, and even chest wall compliance. For the vast majority of patients with ARDS, you should immediately proceed to invasive mechanical ventilation. It's beyond the scope of the CK, remember, knowing exactly what settings to use, but remember that you're going to adjust the FiO2 and PEP to achieve the desired oxygenation goal. Now, the main concern that you have with ARDS is going to be oxygenation. Obviously, increasing the fraction of inspired oxygen, which is FiO2, helps with oxygenation. And then the PEEP also helps with oxygenation because it helps to prevent alveolar collapse upon expiration. Your goal is going to be at a PaO2 between 55 and 80 and an SpO2 of 88 to 95%. And you should try to decrease the FiO2 in order to achieve these parameters. 
More isn't better because there is the possibility of causing damage to airways and pulmonary, pulmonary parenchyma uh, as a result of oxygen toxicity. Now, as I mentioned before, decreased lung compliance can lead to increased pressures, and decreased lung compliance is a prominent feature of ARDS. Having all that proteinaceous fluid and cytokine leakage into alveoli leading to pulmonary edema is going to increase the pressure that the ventilation is going to be fighting against. So to combat this, you're going to set your tidal volume low and compensate with this low tidal volume by increasing the, the respiratory rate so you don't build up too much CO2. Now, finally, aside from mechanical ventilation, which is your main treatment here, you're going to provide other supportive care, such as sedation while on the ventilator, uh, GI and DVT prophylaxis uh, nutritional support, and you want to make sure that you have venous access so that you can administer uh, inotropes as well as pressors. Now, non-invasive ventilation is positive pressure ventilation delivered through a nasal mask or a face mask uh, rather than an endotracheal tube. Now, this is most commonly achieved with BiPAP, and we'll discuss the CPAP when we go over sleep apnea in another lecture, but BiPAP will provide inspiratory positive airway pressure, IPAP, and expiratory PAP at two different levels. The goal is to decrease the work of breathing as well as improve alveolar ventilation. Now, the benefits of this approach is that, of course, we, need, we avoid the need for intubation. And aside from the risk that's associated with intubation, patients on average will have a shorter length of hospital stay as well as decreased incidence of nosocomial infections with a non-invasive ventilation compared to shoving a tube down into the, um, the trachea. Here are some common contraindications to using NPPV. So if they are so seriously ill that cardiac or respiratory arrest is imminent, they should be intubated. If they have facial trauma or recent facial surgery, uh, they won't be able to wear a mask. If they can't cooperate, for example, if they've got altered uh, levels of consciousness or there's a higher likelihood of aspiration, again, this wouldn't work. And finally, if there's an upper airway obstruction, this too wouldn't be reasonable because it's not going to it's not going to get the air where it needs to be. All right, let's do a couple content review questions. I will put 20 seconds on the clock, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is B. Next question. 20 seconds on the clock. Figure this one out and then come on back. The correct answer here is C. And your last question, I will put 20 seconds on the clock, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is C. All right, that is the end of this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.